Thank you. Um, well, it's good to see you all here. It's been a long day. I do have a lot of material to cover because it's hard to cover the, all the concept of social enterprise in the short period of time that I have. So I'm going to be talking pretty fast, but please stop me anytime you don't understand something. It's much more important for me to know that you understood it um, and, and we get through some of what we can than um, not. So I want to thank Chick-fil-A and Plywood uh, people for this opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, as an attorney, which I am, I have to give you my little legal disclaimer, which is that <laughs> I'm only providing general information and not specific legal advice today. Um, now that we got a little bit of a laugh out of that. Um, so here's what I'm going to try and cover today. And I've been advising nonprofit organizations for over 30 years as a lawyer. So this is just what I do day in and day out. Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta provides free legal services to small nonprofits. They have to serve low income or disadvantaged individuals. Um, and um, at the end of this, if you are interested in applying for our services, um, that my, that I think the website is on the last page of this, um, but I can give it to you as well. Um, Plywood People is one of our clients, um, and I have seen some of our other clients here today, so it's really exciting. So what I'm going to do is try and define social enterprise. That's a word that has a lot of different meanings in people's heads. So I want to level set about that. Then I'm going to go through all the tax issues. Unfortunately, 501c3s have to live within the Internal Revenue Code, the regulations, all the cases. I'd like to boil it down. I'm not going to throw out a lot of uh, legalese at you, but I'm going to try and explain it in plain English so you understand the, the walls that you have to live in as a 501c3. But then I'm going to talk about some creative ways to do social and, um, enterprise activities as a 501c3. All right, so what is social enterprise? Social enterprise is the use of market-based strategies. Excuse me, I've been talking all day at other presentations, so bear with me. Um, it's the use of market-based strategies to solve social problems, right? Um, and so you're either selling a good or a service, and you're using that income to do good of some kind. Um, you can be a nonprofit, you can be a for-profit, you can be tax exempt, you can be not. There's multiple ways to do it. But what I'm focused on is 501c3s. And I like to think of it as the following. A revenue generating business of some sort with primarily social objectives, and you have to define what that social objective is, whose surpluses after maintaining the business um, go towards some social objective um, in the community. Um, and you're not being driven by shareholders and profit making, but by having money to do that social good, whatever that social good is. Right. But some common examples of social enterprise activities for nonprofits, 501c3s, are here, listed here. Um, and so, you know, you've got thrift stores, online stores, using your facilities, cafes, catering businesses, lawn services. And one that came up in my meeting this morning that should be on this list is just selling merch um, with your name and logo of your organization. That's really a form of social enterprise, right? But it doesn't result in any problems if you do it correctly, right? And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. But most 501c3s sell t-shirts or sweatshirts or whatever, and they've got the name, the logo, maybe the slogan on it, and that's all fits under an exception to the rule. We'll talk about that. All right, so we've got to start with our threshold issues, um, which is, of course, the Internal Revenue Code. So y'all are already 501c3s, right? Everyone in the room? I just want to make sure I'm level set. All right, um, so the question then becomes, how do you charge for, if you don't now, how do you charge for goods or services? Um, how do you expand the services that you currently offer um, or goods that you currently offer to engage in revenue generation? Um, and, and that's kind of the big picture. There's a lot of buzzwords out there. I hear from a lot of, a lot of executive directors, oh, my board wants us to be self-sustaining or we need to diversify our income and have a diverse source of income. And the truth of the matter is that the IRS is back 30 years ago. And 501c3s, according to the Internal Revenue Code, are not supposed to be self-sustaining. 
that's fundamentally opposite of what the code says. It says you're supposed to rely on donations and gifts and grants and things like that. So we have to live until Congress makes changes. We kind of have to live with what we got and figure out how to work around that. Um, but it makes it a little hard. Um, so we need to understand sort of where it is, where the sweet spots are, how we can make it work, and live within this box that we have to live in. Um, so I want to spend a minute going over this. So 501c3 organizations have to meet a whole bunch of tests. Um, and most of y'all did this when you first started and first set up your organization. So the organizational tests, operational tests, the commerciality doctrine ties into the operational test. There's the public support test. And then once you get through those tests, then you've got the dreaded unrelated business income. Does everybody know what that is? Raise your hand if you don't know what it is so that I can, yeah, I'll get there. <laughs> I just wanna, this is like my, my intro page. And then there's something called private benefit, which is prohibited for nonprofits. So we're gonna go into all of these a little deeper. Um, and we'll start with your purposes test. You all have a purpose. You all have a mission that, and, and it's stated in your articles and in your bylaws what your mission is. It's on your website, I'm sure of it, right? Um, it's probably in the tagline that you have at the bottom of your signature. But you have a very specific purpose. And that purpose must meet one of the purposes under the internal, under 501c3, which we'll get to in a minute. In addition, you have the organizational test. So you exist for the benefit of the public. You have no owners or shareholders, right? You're, you know, that's not allowed for, for a nonprofit corporation or 501c3 entity. Um, you exist for the benefit of, of the broad community, some mission. Um, and your, what you do is to reach your mission. It's geared towards accomplishing that mission. I have had a few clients that have accomplished their mission and they went out of business. I'm like, we did it, we're done. Doesn't happen often, but. Um, and then if you dissolve, what has to happen to your assets? Where do your assets go if you dissolve and close up? Exactly, so those are the rules. And you learned all this when you set up your organization, right? So exempt activities, that's what the Internal Revenue Code said, right? You have to be either charitable, educational, religious, scientific, yada, yada, yada. What you may not have known is that each one of these words is defined. You can't just say, oh, I'm charitable because I'm doing A. Well, that might not be truly charitable under the Internal Revenue Code or the regulations. It's all defined. So charitable includes these things. And then each one of these things is defined and they've been litigated too. So it's, it's not, it, you have to really fit within those. And so that's something key to remember. But I tell you all of that because it's important to make sure that that's your main focus is accomplishing whatever that mission is that you have. And then how you do it and in what manner is what we're gonna talk about and whether there can be some revenue generation through that charitable mission. And then if it's not through the charitable mission, what, how else you might raise money and then the consequences of doing it outside your charitable mission. Does that all make sense? I talk really fast and I got a lot to cover, but please stop me if something's not making sense. All right, so now let's move to that operational test. So your activities, this is, your activities must exclusively, and that's in, in uh, parens, further your charitable purpose because it's actually been interpreted to mean primarily. So primarily your activities have to be accomplishing your charitable mission. It's not really exclusively. So you can do some things that aren't directly in line with your mission. It won't cause you to lose your tax exempt status. However, if you're only spending like 51% of your time on your mission and you're spending 49% on some other business, and the IRS were to look at you, you'd probably lose your exemption. So primarily is somewhere more than 50% and probably something less than 80%. But there's no bright line test, right? So there is some flexibility there. So when we get to unrelated business income, I'm gonna tell you, you can have some unrelated business income. That's income from a trader business, regularly carried on, that's unrelated to your mission. You can do some of that. You just can't do too much of it. And you gotta pay tax on it, any income from that, because it's not part of your mission. We'll get to all that. But you can do some, and that's what that first bullet point talks about. 
Um, you can't have any part of your net earnings go to a private shareholder, individual. We've talked about that. You can't be an action organization, no political campaigning. You can't do too much um, lobbying activity. I'm not talking about those today. I don't have time. Um, and then uh, the commerciality doctrine. So that is you cannot compete with for-profit businesses. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about today because you want to look at can you revenue generate within your charitable mission, but is that revenue generation competing with commercial businesses? And how far are you going beyond sort of your traditional charitable mission and getting more and more commercial? And when does it become a problem? Okay. Um, oh, I mentioned um, the public support test. So let me just say real quickly that you all, as a 501c3 public charity, have to meet your public support test. I'm not going to explain it to you. Most of you probably get at least a third of your revenue from government sources or other 501c3s or the public, um, or from your revenue from um, admissions or things like that. Um, so you want it, as you do more social enterprise activities and generate more revenue, you've got to make sure that it's not going to affect your public support test. That's the only thing. It's a very complicated area, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Don't forget to make sure it doesn't hit your public support test. You don't want to be a private foundation. So, all right. Now let's jump more into some of these, um, uh, the combination of social enterprise activities and 501c3s. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. So like, um, let's say you decide you want to open a donut shop, right? You've got a mission that maybe is helping um, women who have been sex trafficked to um, regain their lives, to move into transitional housing. You're giving them wraparound services. Uh, maybe that's your mission, but you decide you want to open a donut shop down the street. Can you do that? Maybe, maybe. But isn't that um, competing with a for-profit yes, business? Yes, it is. But there's ways in which you can do it, and we'll get to that. But most, of it's, but you have to be careful. And there's a lot of issues that you need to think through if you're going to do that. Like, is that somehow related to your mission? Is this donut? Can you make this donut shop be related? Is any? And we're going to talk through some of these issues. Um, but I just want to pique your your curiosity. Um, is it regularly carried on, this donut shop? Is it open only a couple times a month? Is it like a spaghetti dinner that happens at a church maybe a couple times a month? Or is it really competing with four, and it's open, you know, just like Dunkin' Donuts or Tim Hortons? Um, how much time and energy is the charity putting into it by their staff? Is it somehow segregated and separated? Um, and so, is it competing with commercial businesses? Is it acting like a commercial business? So we're going to get into all those kinds of things and think that through. All right. Um, so let's start by looking at the charitable activities you currently conduct. Um, and most organizations are serving a charitable class, right? Like I mentioned my example. They're serving victims of sex trafficking, right? That's the charitable class that they serve. Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, we provide free legal services. Well, providing legal services in and of itself is not a charitable activity, right? There's nothing charitable about that. But I provide them for free to small nonprofits. That's what makes it charitable, my charitable class that I'm serving. Sometimes there's activities that are actually the activity is charitable. But usually, there's also a charitable class component. So when you're talking about expanding services, are you expanding your charitable class? And maybe are you changing up that class to give you access to more money? So we'll, talk, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit further. But the first question is, is the activity that you're going to charge for primarily charitable? Like We could charge probably 25 bucks a, you know, an hour for our services to the same clients if they could afford it. And we'll talk about how that would work. And it might still be charitable. There's lots of charities out there that charge for services, right? 
food banks often charge five to ten dollars a month because they don't want their clients to feel like they're just getting a handout. They want them to feel like they're a customer. It's important. Um, there's a lot of therapy services that are charged ten to fifteen dollars an hour, twenty dollars an hour. A lot of after school programs charge a small amount a month. It's still a charitable activity because they're still serving a charitable class, but they do charge something. The zoo charges for you to get in, right? It's still a charity. It's still an educational organization. I refer to it as charity, but I really mean all of those different things under Section 501c3. I'm just lumping them into the word charity. Um, so you can charge for your services that fall under your exempt mission, um, and that's okay as long under certain circumstances. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit uh, more. So, um, so is the activity charitable? Is it going to benefit a private individual more than it's going to benefit the organization's mission? Are you competing with for-profit businesses, like we said? And then how large is this activity going to be? Is it going to be huge, small? How's it going to work? Um, and so we're going to talk through those, and our goal is we're going to make sure we're, we're primarily conducting our charitable activity and trying to avoid taxation penalties and loss of tax-exempt status. Loss of tax-exempt status happens when you're no longer, when you're not primarily conducting your charitable activity, when you're primarily running a donut shop, and then you happen to be helping a few people over here on the side, right? Um, all right, so. How many of you actually charge for your charitable services? Does anybody in the room? All right, a couple of you. You do? All right, see, so you get that. It's okay to charge for those services. Um, there's, there's some rules around that. And the first rule is that you can charge as long as you're not depriving a major part of your charitable community access to your service. So if that food pantry started charging 75 bucks a week, a lot of people couldn't get that service, right? So you'd be depriving your, your class access. So then it's no longer charitable. And so now you have to reduce the amount that you're charging in order to make it reasonable, which is why it's five to $10 a month. Now you're looking a lot more like a grocery store or a grocery co-op, right? If you're charging $75 a week. So that's one of the key factors you need to think about. And the other one is that, you, that you're not deriving a, a um, profit beyond what's necessary to conduct your activity. So this is the kicker, because all those board members that are telling you, yeah, you need to be self-sustaining, it says, no, you can't do more than what it takes to help your charity, you know, your charitable class. So how can you be self-sustaining if it's going to take all of that to help the class? So it's, it's, a, it's a yin and a yang here. So if either of those happen, oh, sorry, that happened to my slide. Um, it's no longer charitable. These slides looked fine on, on my side. Um, all right. Um, so, so we can certainly charge something. The question is how much? And then the question is, OK, let's say you're charging, you're the food pantry, and you're charging 5 to $10. What if you wanted to say charge $15? Or maybe there's another class of people that could use your services, but you would charge them a bit more. So go back to Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. What if we decided to, char to help not small community-based nonprofits, but maybe a little larger nonprofits, and maybe they can afford to pay for some of their services? Is that still charitable? Um, and so it might be. You have to consider what it is that you're offering and how you're offering it and whether you're competing with other for-profit businesses. So there's opportunity to expand services maybe that you already provide and charge for um, to a, a little different class. Therapy services is a really good example. So let's say I provide therapy services to um, low-income children um, and they, they pay me 10 to 15 dollars a session. Let's say 10 dollars a session. Well, let's say I realize, you know, there's a lot of people sort of that are just above sort of that category on, under HUD's rules that also need, need access to therapy services. 
but those and those people can't afford to pay for regular therapy services I mean it's like 150 bucks an hour who could afford that and so there's a lot of maybe middle-income people that could really benefit from those services but maybe they could pay $50 an hour but they're not going to go at 150 so they're not getting the service so is that okay to do and then the question is and this is what we're going to get into is how to analyze that all right, so commerciality. Um, commerciality is a critical element of this. Is it a commercial, is it, are you competing with a commercial business? So the first thing you look at, again, is it in furtherance of your exempt purposes? And is your primary purpose not to engage in an unrelated trade or business? So let's go back to that therapy services. It's it's related. They're offering therapy services to children in need. The question is, can they afford to pay for it? And are you competing commercially with somebody else? So, um, and by the way, making money to support your mission is never good enough. Like, I can't say, oh, well, I got this donut shop. All the money's coming to my charity, and so it's okay. Because you're still running a, a donut shop, which has nothing to do with anybody's charitable mission as a standalone regular donut shop. Um, so the IRS, as we've talked about, can impose or deny your tax exempt status um, if you're operating that kind of a business. Um, and I mentioned about the public support test already. So the, one of the first cases that came out was in 1961, and it involved the sale of Bibles. There was a charity that was selling Bibles, and the court came out and said, look, there are stores that sell Bibles. There are lots of places that sell Bibles, and it's a commercial activity. It may sort of be related to your mission, but you're selling a book. No matter what's in that book and how precious that book may be, it is not related to your mission. And you're com more importantly, even if it is, it's competing commercially. So it was determined to be um, a commercial activity and unrelated business income. But the key case is a living faith case. A lot of these cases involve religion um, as a background, so uh, for whatever reason. But in this one, it was a Seventh-day Adventist church, and they operated vegetarian restaurants and health food stores. And, and vegetarianism is tied into the Seventh-day Adventist um, uh, beliefs. So they tried to argue, look, this is, we're just, you know, doing our beliefs. But if you looked at what they were doing with these restaurants, if you went to one of their restaurants and you went to another vegetarian restaurant, you couldn't tell them apart. They were open the same hours. They did the same kind of advertising. They charged the same amount. They had all employees. They didn't have a single volunteer. And guess what the kicker was? They didn't receive charitable contributions as an organization, going back to that whole concept. And so this is the case that really drove it. So they were, they were com clearly competing with for-profit businesses. You couldn't tell which one was for-profit and which one was nonprofit. And that's the, uh, the elements of commerciality that you have to consider when you're looking at these sorts of things. So um, let me catch up on my notes. Make sure I'm not missing anything. All right. So let's say you're going to charge um, for services. And let's talk about how you could do that and it not be considered commerciality. And this is a really critical factor. Had the Living Faith case charged below cost for their food, then um, then they wouldn't be competing commercially. And this is a critical element that you'll see over and over again. It's not below market, it's below your cost. So what does that mean? Yeah, it can't be self-sustaining, right? Um, but you can do it. So, and if you expand your services and you're helping more people and you're bringing in more money, you might be able to get more donations and more grants. Um, because you're offering another service line, right? So that's an option. So 
the way it works with below cost is that the services, if they're commercial in nature, may be considered charitable if you're providing them at below cost. Subs and it's not just below cost, it's substantially below cost, which is more than 20% below what it costs you to put it on. Now, there's also another provision, and that is if you're providing those goods or services to other 501c3s, then it's like your equivalent of giving out grants. So I don't know if anybody's ever heard of TechBridge, um, but it's an organization here in Atlanta, and they work around the US, and they provide um, technology services to 501c3s. Um, and they help bring in the grant money to fund them to provide the services to the 501c3s. So they're like the, per, the, the poster child of that bullet point from the IRS. Um, but you have to make sure that, that you're providing it, um, the services to the poor at substantially below cost in order for it to be considered charitable. All right, um, let's talk a little bit more about how that's defined. And I've already said at cost, you don't have a donative intent, right? So we know it's got to be at least 15% or more than 15% below cost, because the case law has shown that. Examples of below cost factors, well, you're getting donations. We talked about this already, right? That there's no commercial business that's willing to do it at that price. So I've had clients who said, you know, I really want to do this activity. And I said, well, does anybody else out there do it at that price, the price you want to charge? And they look around, they're like, there's nobody in the commercial world that's even touching this. I was like, well, probably because they've realized they can't make any money off of it. So you can do it as part of your activities. Just know you're probably not going to sustain, be sustainable through it. And it's not an economically feasible business. But sometimes that's because you're using volunteers. Or think back to those examples that were on my list of those areas that are social um, that are, that are social enterprise activities for 501c3s. Thrift stores, how do they work? Well, they get all their stuff donated, right? So that's how it works. That's not a business. It's not a business. I'm not gonna go to a for-profit and give them a bunch of stuff so that they can sell it, right? So those are the creative ways that you need to be thinking about, and we're gonna get into more of that for nonprofits. Um, you have to be, of course, in terms of um, if you're serving the poor, relieving poverty at least nominally, if not more. So you have to look at your pricing if that's your mission and make sure that you're achieving it. All right, so what happens if you open this donut shop and let's, let's move to something else. Let's move to spaghetti. My alma mater, NYU School of Law, acquired the Mueller Spaghetti Factory in the 1930s. They thought, this is great. We'll make so much money from the spaghetti factory, we won't have to charge the students. We're educational, we're a 501c3, right? And they were making a killing, and they could cut prices by 20% and put everyone else out of business because they didn't have to pay income tax. They were 501c3. Well, I can tell you that in the early 1940s, all the other Italian spaghetti factory owners were not happy. And um, there were hearings in Congress, IRS brought a case against them, and this is what generated the unrelated business income rules. But basically they said, look, you've got this big old spaghetti factory and this little law school. And they said, your tail's wagging the dog. So they said, you have to sell the spaghetti factory or you will lose your tax exempt status. Because you're mostly a spaghetti factory and on the side you're doing this little charitable activity. So as you're thinking about doing some kind of activity, you want to make sure that the tail is not wagging the dog. But you can do some of it and pay tax on it. And that's where we're going. So unrelated business income tax. It's taxable income. It's, it's a three-part test. It has, if it's a trade or a business and it's regularly carried on, and regularly carried on is like what does a for-profit commercial business do? Uh, a greeting cards for Christmas are only sold from August to December. Um, if you sell greeting cards from August to December, you're competing. You don't have to sell it year-round because that's not when greeting card or Christmas cards are sold. Um, so you have to look at the regularity of that for-profit business and that you're continuously doing it. Um, and doing it in the same way as a commercial business. 
and it's not substantially related to your mission. So let's go back to our donut shop. If we run that donut shop from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day, we are likely competing with a lot of donut shops in town. Um, that would be, and it's a, clearly a trader business, right? And it's regularly carried on, and it has nothing to do with our mission. So the income from that, and the fact that the money's helping us doesn't count. The income from that is unrelated business income, and you have to pay income tax on that at the corporate rate, which is now 20%. Um, it used to be graduated, and so now it's just a hard 20%. So you have to pay tax on that. Well, maybe this donut shop's really small and not a whole huge amount of revenue or income or activity for us. Maybe we're some really big, maybe we're the Atlanta Community Food Bank. We're massive, right? And then we've got this little donut shop that, you know, that might be okay and I might be willing to pay tax on that money. The key is to make sure that I'm still primarily conducting my charitable activity and that this is a smaller activity. All right, and I'm not spending too much time on it. And then, of course, you know, there's, you gotta file a 990T, you gotta file a 600T, um, and pay the state and federal taxes that go along with that. So, so going back to the donut shop, could you get away with not paying taxes if you had volunteers? We're gonna get to that. Okay. That's next. You're jumping right into my next slide, perfect. Volunteers, so there's a ton. I could spend two days going through in detail all of the exclusions, modifications, and exceptions to the unrelated business taxable income rules. And in fact, there's like modifications to the exclusion to the exception. Like it's crazy. But these are the key ones that I wanna really briefly run through. Volunteers is a critical one. If 90% or more of the work is done by volunteers, then it's not a commercial business. Like you're not competing with anybody because you couldn't survive if you had to pay those people. So that's how, that, ex, that's how that, um, that exclusion came to be. The, I call that the Girl Scout cookie exception, right? Because selling cookies is not charitable in any way, shape, or form. It's not even educational. Selling cookies might be educational. I was a Girl Scout leader. It might be educational. They learn a lot between that, but they're still selling cookies, right? But because all these little Girl Scouts are volunteers and the leaders are volunteers, it meets the exception, 90% or more. Training program, hold that thought, I'm gonna go into that in a minute, which does apply to our donut shop. Contributed property, if you have a thrift store, as long as 90% or more of what you sell in that thrift store is donated property, all of the sales are not taxable. However, if you have 15% of the items from consignment, for instance, the entire thrift store is taxable. It's a, there's no case law on this either. There's just the code. And it literally says 90% or more must be contributed property that's sold in that environment. Passive income. Of course, this isn't really social enterprise, but I just wanted to put it up there. But royalties can be, cause marketing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I'm probably gonna be running over time soon. Um, and then um, cause marketing. And then for-profit subsidiaries. If you really want to do it, drop it into a for-profit subsidiary. We can talk about that. Rents from real property. Maybe you're gonna, uh, maybe you have a beautiful facility and you want to rent it out. If you own it and there's no mortgage, there's a chance that you can do that, right? So that's an opportunity. All right, we have a bunch of resources on our website. I encourage you to go to our website. Um, it's pbpatl.org. We have tons of resources. We have a whole learning center with webcasts, podcasts, um, and articles. Um, we also have our application on there if you're interested. So let's talk creative solutions. These are the three things I want to talk about. Training programs. Who's heard of Refuge Coffee? All right, Refuge Coffee is a training program. It's a coffee shop. It's a cafe. But what they do is they have a rigorous training program where they're taking people who are immigrants to this country, they're refugees, and they're training them to be workers in America, and also to become baristas, and to become actually like the, um, the managers of these stores. And so they have a detailed training program. They, um, you can't be in the training program forever, so you can't work there forever. You have to progress through the training program. There has to be 80% of the people must be trainees, and 20% 
um, no, more, no less than 80% trainees and no more than 20% of the people there can be the trainers. You can have more, you can do 90, 10, but you can't have less than 80%. So that the whole purpose, and you could do this in the donut shop, right? You could have 80% of the people in the training program, but also the training program can only be as big as necessary to conduct the training. Well, Refuge Coffee's growing. They have all kinds of catering businesses and they've got trucks, and that's because they're expanding their training program. As more refugees are coming in, they're serving more refugees, but they keep that 80-20 separation rule and the people are graduating and going on to other jobs but what it does is it gives them the ability to show hey I can hold down a job in the US I've been successful at that I can come in at the right time leave at the right time I have skills um, they also do financial literacy training and some other things as part of their training program so that's a really good option there's two major revenue rulings that lay that all out but we have an article on this on our website that gets into more detail Cause marketing, everybody knows what cause marketing is, right? So cause marketing is a great way to do some social enterprise work, right? You license your name and your logo, that's passive. You're not doing anything. You're just saying here, yeah, you can use my name and logo, but I get a dollar from every item you sell that has my name on it and logo on it. That was what Susan G. Komen did with the pink buckets of fried chicken, sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have given that example. That's what Yo Play Yoga does every October with their lids. And that goes to Susan G. Komen. Susan G. Komen's the master of cause marketing. And that's but not taxable? No, because it's a royalty. So it's passive income. So it falls into one of the exceptions. So every year in October, pink lids on Yo Play Yogurt. Every time you turn in a pink lid, you, uh, Susan G. Komen gets 10 cents for every lid. First year, they made $6 million. It's a lot of money. Right? It's just loaning out their name. Now there's rules. A lot of rules and you got to follow them but you can do it so that's company a does uh, well by doing good for charity B um, the American Heart Association does the go red campaign as well and they do that with businesses um, who support um, their their name and logo um, in their month of go red um, I believe coca-cola does that one um, all right the last thing I want to talk about is for-profit subsidiaries has anyone heard of The Giving Kitchen? The Giving Kitchen. So it's an organization here in Atlanta. Has anybody heard of a very famous restaurant called Staple House? It won the James Beard Award two years after it opened. Staple House, when it was set up, was the for-profit subsidiary of The Giving Kitchen. Now, and then the idea is, so you could buy, you could open this donut shop as a for-profit business that is completely owned by the charity. Charity is the sole owner of that donut shop. You can't have the people running the charity running the donut shop. That doesn't work. It has to be separate people. And honestly, if you want your donut shop to be successful, your executive director, who's a nonprofit person, should not be running your donut shop, right? Think about that for a minute. You need someone who knows how to run that business and the people that work there. You can have a little bit of crossover in your board, a little bit of crossover in your employees, but it really does need to be separate. Um, then what happens is once that for-profit business, maybe the donut shop is making money hand over fist. So at the end of the day, it wants to keep some of that to reinvest in its store, but then it gives a dividend up to its parent, which is the nonprofit. And that's how these for-profits work. I will tell you, a lot of people think, oh yeah, I'll just start a for-profit. In fact, I had a client that came to me that said, I want to start a Chick-fil-A as, as their for-profit business. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a little complicated. I said, you've got to get a franchise and you've got to have work with them. And then, yeah, you could potentially do that. And then once they realize the complexity of it and the amount of time it takes to really make a profit and then have enough of a profit that they're going to give a dividend that's meaningful up to the charity, it's, it's a lot sexier sounding than it actually is in real practice. And in fact, Giving Kitchen sold Staple House. So um, as an example. So that's another one. There's some of these other super complex areas that I'm not going to go into. 
they're like really big, you know, hospital systems, universities, other super big nonprofits engage in some of these things. But you could set up a public benefit corporation, which is completely separate from a 501c3. Georgia does have a public benefit corporation code. Um, I helped to draft it. So it, that is an available option. So there are some other options out there. Um, overall, ways to mitigate your risk. Wow, how did that get small like that? Um, broaden your scope. Maybe take, if you're charging, for instance, those therapy services, maybe go to that next level, but still making sure it's charitable. That brings in more revenue. Maybe it keeps your employees busier, right? So think about expanding your charitable base of what you're doing and your charitable income just a little bit, but still making sure with, you're within that charitable realm. Or expanding it outside and paying unrelated business income, keeping track of making sure it's not too much, and then paying the tax. Unrelated business income is not evil. You just have to make sure you're tracking it, paying the tax, and that it's not too much of your activity. Um, or generate revenue under an exclusion or modification. Volunteers, thrift shop, all those sorts of things we've just been discussing, the training program option. Um, and then the royalties through cause marketing um, or doing the taxable subsidy. All right, questions. <laughs> I'm at time, but I'm happy, a little over, but I'm happy to stay and answer any questions anybody might have. Yeah. You are a client. <laughs> so as we were kind of shifting into this digital world, what are some type of red flags? Like for us, we had people talk about selling uh, NFTs of Putin's um, visual projects and stuff like that. So, so it's, that's a really interesting. So think about this, catering business. City of Refuge has a catering business, but it's as a result of a training program. So they train people how to become caterers and they have a food that comes out of it like you need to have a project so they sell catering food but it's only to serve that training program so when you're serving kids and they're creating things you can potentially sell that byproduct because that's not the goal is for them to just generate those things it's through an educational process you may be able to do that we had a client that had somebody who created 200 NFTs and just sold them for them and gave them all the money. Um, so it's an interesting area and it's a growing area. Well, request for that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we need to talk about it further. <laughs> to remember, general legal advice. <laughs> all right, <laughs> yes. Question, and I'm gonna put this in an education example. Mm -hmm. So um, universities, um, colleges are mostly nonprofit, um, but they charge so like those that can afford, they're charging like a lot. So they and have a sliding they're scale, less, right? But they're still all falling under the nonprofit, even though they're so charging more. They're an educational organization. Mm -hmm. Their exemption is not because they have a charitable class. Their exemption is because they're an educational organization. So that's but different. It's because their whole mission is education. Mm -hmm. So remember, the well, exempt let's the activities. Food, let's go back to the food bank then. If, if they were to then want to bring in regular paying customers at 300 a month, but they, and they use some of that to support the people they charge $25 a month, are they running into problems because they're charging the 300 a month? Yeah, so you can have a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. The YMCA does that all the time. It's complicated. And you can't have so many people coming in at that $300 level such that it becomes its own business activity. But you can have some. You can have some to support. Yes, you could. But you have to be really careful to make sure that it's just there to help generate and keep the business going for the others. So it can't be the focus. And you have to look at and actually do an analysis of the society of the people you're serving and make sure the percentages line up. So we had a client that was looking into that, and I said, all right, well, you can have look at what is your radius? What is your community? Then get the statistics. What percentage of that community is in, the, you know, is in this radius, and how much could they pay? And, what, and you have to do a lot of detailed analysis of their fungible income and all kinds of things to set those prices. 
YMCA does that nationwide for their different locations. And, and they have their exemption, there's nobody like the Y. They have been around a really long time, they have some special rules, just like the Salvation Army has some special rules. They, and the American Red Cross, they get some special things. So, um, because they've just been around for so long and evolved over time. But there is a way to do that. Other questions? All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.